All right, I know you have your Bibles there in Proverbs 23, uh, but for now, please uh, turn to Genesis chapter 9. Turn to Genesis chapter 9. And uh, I'll be preaching today. Uh, before we had the coronavirus, before the pandemic, I was going through a series. I was going through a series called Sins That Will Get You Kicked Out of Church. All right, now look, it's not my desire to kick people out of church. I, I'm not like on this trigger to just find somebody in some terrible sin to kick them out. But the Bible is very clear that there are some sins that are committed by brethren, and it's better if that person is not part of church. You might say, well, that's unloving. But here's the thing. It, it's partly so they understand how wicked that sin is in the eyes of God, but also partly to protect the congregation. So they don't get affected. They don't get influenced to do the same sins themselves. And some of these sins may seem in our society as very acceptable. But in the eyes of God, they are very wicked. And I'll just read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, that's a saved person in our church, be a fornicator, so we covered that, or covetous, we've covered that, or an idolater, we've covered that, or a railer, we've preached on that, we're up to part number five now, or a drunkard, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such and one know not to eat. Drunkenness. Now look, we're, we're, we live in Australia. And, you know, one of these things that we were noticing about the, the restrictions being lifted, you know, what you'll see in the media is, hey, when's, when can we go to the pub and have a drink with our mates? Right? So embedded in our culture is this idea of alcohol consumption. You know, it's just a social gathering. It's something we do with our mates. And it may seem like if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the Bible, you're not familiar with what God has to say, you may seem like, well, this is just normal life. This is just what everybody does. It's what people do to have a good time. It's what people do to relax. It's what people do to release a bit of tension. And yet God says drunkenness is a sin worthy of being kicked out of the church. And so this is part five of sins that will get you kicked out of church on drunkenness. Now, when it comes to uh, this topic of drunkenness within uh, churches, there are different camps. There are different ideas of what this means. And camp number one, when it comes to the Bible, the thought will be, well, within the Bible, you know, it, it talks about the word wine. Now, wine is the, is, the, is the word that is most often used by God when dealing with this topic. But sometimes the Lord may use words like strong drink, okay, or the mixed wine. But wine is a, is a, is a word that's used very often in the Bible. And you either come from two perspectives. Number one, you know, when we think of wine, don't we automatically think of alcohol? You know, if I said, hey, I'm going to drink some wine right now, wouldn't you automatically think, well, he must be drinking alcohol, right? So some people take that perception of how we define wine today, and they apply that for the entire Bible. Every time the Bible says wine, they think this has to do with an alcoholic drink, okay? That's one camp. But then there's a, another camp, there's another side to this that says, well, no, you know, the word wine is a more general term. And this is the camp that I sit in. And the word wine has to do not with the alcohol content, but the word wine has to do with the product of the vine. Okay? And so in, in Spanish, the word vine is... What is, what is the word vine in Spanish? Vina. 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 All right? And, and alcohol would be vino. So the word wine comes from the, it has the same root word as vine, vine. So the fruit of the vine, the, the produce of the vine is called wine. And what you'll notice and what I'll be teaching to you today is the difference between what the Bible refers to as alcoholic wine and also non-alcoholic wine. And yet the Bible itself will refer to it most often than not just a general word, of wine as the product that's come from the vine not necessarily referring to the fact that it is referring to alcohol okay so these are the two thoughts and even the church that i was sent from had the idea that wine always represented an alcoholic drink okay now look at genesis chapter 9 and verse number 20 genesis chapter 9 verse number 20 this is the first mention of the word wine in genesis chapter 9 verse number 20 it says and noah began to be an husbandman so that's someone that works in a vineyard and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine we say well hold on he drank of the wine could this be alcoholic or could this be non-alcoholic that's a good question but within the context it's answered and was drunken Okay, so obviously if he gets drunk, what was he drinking? Alcoholic wine. 
All right. Now, is that the right thing to do? Well, that's the question. We see Noah, God used Noah in a mighty way, and yet he got to a point where he was drunken. And it says, and he was uncovered within his tent. So one aspect or one, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, consequence of getting drunk is potentially just getting naked. Okay, just getting naked, not realizing that he's undressed. So he's uncovered within his camp. Verse number 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth, look what they do, took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. So there's one son that points out, hey, dad's naked, but the other two sons, actually, well, he's naked, we better cover him. Yeah, there was one that was kind of mocking him, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, not desiring to cover his father. But the other two said, no, we need to cover our father, right? So they go in backwards so they can't see their father's nakedness and they cover their father. In verse number 24, it says, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And so he curses Canaan, who's the son of Ham. So there's obviously something very wicked took place here. Some people believe maybe there was some type of uh, filthy perversion that took place with, uh, with uh, Ham here. Or just the fact that he left him uncovered, that he left him naked. That could be wickedness as well. Because one of the first things that you notice when you're reading through the book of Genesis is that Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness. But the Lord came and covered them with coats of skin. And so the Lord wants us, now that we're in a fallen, sinful state, to cover up our nakedness. So that could part be part of that uh, wickedness that took place. But the first thing I want you to notice, the first mention of wine is alcoholic wine. And it, falls, it comes to this point where there's nakedness and the, uh, Noah's, uh, Noah curses his grandson for what his father did. Okay, so you can see a, a really this, this has a negative connotation. The first time wine is mentioned is in a very negative sense, and we obviously understand this is about alcohol. Now, if you can please go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 11, because you know there is a principle of uh, the first mention that's a, that's a good way to understand the Bible. You know, you look up the first time the Lord mentions something in the Bible, usually it'll tell us what He thinks about that. And the first mention of alcohol is, well, it's very wicked, okay? And it, it really hurt the family of Noah. But if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13, I want to show you now how the word wine can also uh, be attributed to non-alcoholic beverage. Because it says in verse number 13, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I commanded you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in due season. I'll stop there in a moment. What land is this referring to? Obviously, when the Lord delivered Israel out of uh, Egypt, he wanted them to go into the promised land, the land of Canaan, right? And this land was going to be a very fruitful land. It was a very blessed land. The Lord was going to reward that nation. But look at this. It keeps going. The first rain and the latter rain that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Okay, now think about this. If you are uh, walking into land, and, and by the way, corn there is not corn like we eat corn, right? Corn is a reference to just uh, uh, wheat or, um, you know, like barley or, or something like that. So, you know, the, the, the kernel re was referred to as the corn there. And so when the Lord refers to that you can gather your corn off the land, is that a raw product that can be gathered? Okay, it's obviously not bread, right? It's been gathered as corn, as something that is raw off the land. And then he says, and thy wine. Do you think when God led the Israelites into the land of Canaan, that there were barrels of fermented wine, alcoholic wine, just sitting there so they could just drink of it? What are your thoughts? Or, or do you think by wine he's referring to the grapes? <laughs> the grapes that are on the trees, the grapes that are on the grapevine. Okay, obviously the, the raw product, okay? It's not like the Lord saying, all right, you're going to the land of Canaan and you're going to have barrels of alcohol there so you can party up all night. No, he's referring to the raw product that's off the land, you know, and of the, of the oil there, right? And so what we see there is obviously the Lord referring to wine as something that the land produces, okay? Just like the corn, just like that which what comes out. But wine, alcoholic wine, requires you to take that product off the land 
and obviously crush those grapes and you know, uh, ferment that product. Okay? So what we see there is a reference of wine in a non-alcoholic, very raw sense. And even, I'll just, I'll just read to you, in, actually turn there, go to Proverbs chapter 3. Go to Proverbs chapter 3, because we will come back to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, please. And I want to show you this, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 10. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 10 says, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine new wine and so if you go to some of those european countries i know in some of these places they still press wine with their feet right and maybe you know france where they get all the grapes the clusters of grapes they put it in some big barrel and then you'll go in there barefoot and you'll press down those grapes and what will flow out of that press is new wine now let me ask you if you take grapes off the vine and you trample on it and you let the juice flow is that alcoholic no, it's non alcoholic, right? It's fresh. It's new wine. And so, this new wine that is being burst through from the presses, of course, is non alcoholic. Okay? And so, you can see how the Lord uses the word wine for alcoholic wine, but also wine as a general sense for non alcoholic wine. And even in Isaiah, you don't need to turn that, just read it to you quickly. Isaiah 65, verse 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. As the new wine is found in the cluster. What's the cluster? The cluster of grapes, right? So if you were to go to a grapevine, you see a cluster of grapes, you might pull that off, cut it off. Well, within that cluster, the Lord says that there is new wine found in that cluster. Again, is that alcoholic? If you ate that grape, would you get drunk? Would you have the effects of alcohol? Of course not, okay? So again, you see the Lord referring to the word wine as a non-alcoholic product. Now, the argument is this. Well, hold on, Pastor Kevin. You know, you've grown up in Baptist churches. You've been going to church your whole life. You know, your parents come from a fundamental Christian church in Chile. You know, you've been going to fundamental uh, churches, independent fundamental Baptists. And, you know, the Baptists, the fundamentals, you know, they've got this, you know, all mixed up, right? The reason you think that wine can refer to alcoholic and non-alcoholic is because you were taught in church or because that's how you were told to interpret the Bible. And, and that's a fair point. That's a possibility. I understand that it's poten- you know, I, I have the potential of being influenced incorrectly. But here's the thing. This is, the the Bible is not the only place where you'll see the word wine referred to as alcoholic or non-alcoholic. In fact, it's found throughout just other books, other things that have nothing to do with the Bible. And I'll just show you, uh, you know, in, in, in 300 BC, 300 years before Jesus Christ, there was this Greek politician known as uh, Calixinus, who was a contemporary of Socrates. A lot of people know Socrates, this philosopher. Well, a contemporary of his was this Greek politician, Calixinus, and he wrote that they were, I'll just read it to you, uh, they were trampling on the grapes and the new wine ran out over the whole road. So this is before Christ. He's referring, he's writing about a new wine that is being trampled on the streets. There are grapes on the streets. They're being trampled. And what's flowing out of there? He uses the word new wine. Would that be alcoholic wine that's flowing out there? No, it's obviously non-alcoholic. It's, it's, it's grape juice that's being flown out, flown out of there. Well, what about after Jesus Christ? Well, after Jesus Christ, in 350 to 400 AD, there was this guy called Gemara that wrote about wine, and he wrote how wine is preserved in its grapes. Wine is preserved in its grapes. So once again, he's saying, look, within the grape, there's wine, and it's preserved there. Is that alcoholic? No, it's not alcoholic, right? And then in 1670 AD, so when was the King James Bible translated? 1611, right? So around the time of the King James Bible, 1670 AD, there was an English author that wrote a book. His name was Edward Phillips, and he wrote, Wine Newly Pressed from the Grapes. Wine Newly Pressed from the Grapes. So if it's newly pressed, it's just come out, is it alcoholic? No. Okay, it's just juice, but he refers to it as wine. And then in 1828, in the Noah Webster Dictionary, under new wine, it says wine pressed from the grape, but not fermented. Okay, wine pressed from the grape, but not fermented. Okay, this is in the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary. Say, what's your point? My point is, 
even outside of the Bible, if we go before Christ, we go after Christ, we go closer to when the King James Bible was translated, and we come to a closer time, like 1828, when the English language was well developed, they still used, even throughout all these hundreds of years, as wine as a reference to both alcoholic and non-alcoholic products. Okay, so it's a general term. And so we don't need just, you can't just say, well, you know, you just got that from your fundamental churches. No, even other writings, you know, that have nothing to do with the Bible, refers to the word wine for these two things, alcoholic and non-alcoholic. And I don't think that is that difficult to understand because it's like the word gay. All right, now I, I wouldn't like to, I don't like to refer to anything as gay today because of the connotation about homosexuality, right? But the Bible does refer to at the word gay as gay clothing. You know, the word gay originally has to do with being joyful, being happy. You know, I remember when I was a, a child in the 80s, I don't know, did you, anyone ever watch the Flintstones? Flintstones, you know, one of the, the songs at the end of the Flintstones was, you know, we'll have a gay old time. And what that meant is that, you know, the Flintstones are having a great time. It's a joyful time. You watch this cartoon, you're going to enjoy it. Obviously, it had nothing to do about homosexuality. And so what we see even within my time, you know, as a child watching a television program to today, we've seen how English words can change. All right. And so when it comes to the word wine, yeah, eventually it became, as we know it today, as something that is just alcoholic. Okay, but throughout history, throughout the beginning of the English language, you know, wine could be used interchangeably between any of those two things. So the question is, you know, when it comes to the topic of alcohol, is alcohol a sin? Is alcohol a sin? Now, one thing that's amazing to me, and I don't know why it stopped, but when I first was made a pastor, when I was ordained a pastor and I went to the Sunshine Coast, I had all these weirdos call me. Like, we put out my phone number on the website, and all of a sudden, I just had all these people ringing me all across Australia. Just weirdos. And I don't know if it's the same people. I don't know if they were friends. I don't know. But they kept asking me basically two questions. What do you think about divorce? And what do you think about alcohol? Is alcohol a sin? And I was like, once, okay, I answered once. It's like, another question like this? Another question? And one thing that surprised me is, you know, for myself personally, I've never really liked alcohol. I can't say that I've never drunk alcohol because when I, was a, when I turned 18 and you turned the legal age, you might want to experiment. I went out there and experimented and went to some parties and, and drank some alcohol. So I can't say that I never drank it. But one thing that I'm very thankful for, I hated the stuff. I did it out of a social pressure. I did it just to get along with mates. I never enjoyed it myself, honestly. I just never, it's something that I could never really enjoy. And I thank God for my wife because she's seen the effects that alcohol can have. And she hates alcohol. When she, when she smells fermented uh, grapes, she just uh, kind of, she wants to throw up by the smell. So for me and my wife, we, we just never really enjoyed alcohol. And so it's, it's not a topic that really interested me much. I never really, you know, uh, cared much to study this topic in the Bible, but I was surprised by how many phone calls I would receive. Is alcohol a sin? And let me just say to you, that question is a stupid question. There's no one answer to that question, is alcohol a sin? Because alcohol in of itself, well, actually, let, let me cover this. Because I, I, what this sermon is, it's going to answer this question in three ways. And let me give you three answers to, is alcohol a sin? Because it all depends on the context that's been referred to there, right? Is alcohol a sin? No. Answer number one is no, it's not a sin. Is alcohol a sin? Answer number two is yes, it's a sin. And answer number three is yes, it's a sin. No, yes, and yes. But you see, people don't ask the question, is drinking wine a sin? Is drinking a beer a sin? The question is, is alcohol a sin? And that is up to, it depends on the context of which you're asking that question. So let me uh, teach this. Let me explain to you why it is not a sin and then why it is a sin and why it is a sin, okay? So answer number one, why is it not a sin? Well, first of all, alcohol is a liquid created by fermentation, okay? Alcohol is a liquid created by uh, fermentation and fermentation is basically when yeast or bacteria break down sugars, and as it's breaking down those sugars, it becomes fermented, it becomes alcoholic. You know, you can take fruit juice and it can, you can leave it out, it can go bad, you can open it and allow bacteria to enter it through the air and that bacteria will start eating through those sugars and the output will be alcohol. You, you can actually turn uh, just normal juice into, into alcohol, okay? Say, so, well, you know, some people have the position 
that, well, alcohol is always a sin. It's always a sin. Well, I'm just saying to you that alcohol is something that happens naturally. It's a chemical compound. I think I've written down what it is. It's basically two carbon molecules, one from the methyl group, one from the methylene group, which attaches itself to one oxygen, oxygen molecule from the hydroxyl group. Okay, so it's a chemical. So the question is, is this chemical a sin? Right? Is, is a chemical a sin? And there are some that will just say, look, it is always a sin, they'll say. It's always a sin. Even if you just look at alcohol, you've committed sin. But here's what's strange about that, is that if I go to that person's house, I promise you, I promise you if I go to your house, I'll find alcohol. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Because alcohol is just a chemical compound. All right? You say, where do we find it in people's homes? Well, number one, if you brush your teeth, it's in your toothpaste. If you use mouthwash, it's in your mouthwash. If you use creams, moisturizing cream or any kinds of cream, sun cream, when you go to the beach or something, there's alcohol there. If you use super glue, there's alcohol there. Okay? If you, what else, what else is there right here? Um, any kinds of external creams, super glue, uh, vanilla extract. I know some people like bacon, some ladies like bacon, they might use vanilla extract. You know that vanilla extract has like 35% alcohol in it? You know, if you get the real stuff, the good stuff, you know, is, is that a sin? Is it a sin that you use that vanilla extract to make some muffins, some vanilla muffins? You know, vanilla ice cream has alcohol because it's usually used, it's usually made with that vanilla extract. And what about now? What about now during the COVID-19? What is everyone re recommending? My dad and I went to Bunnings today to get that sign there, toilets, right? And we walk in into Bunnings and there's, what do you, what, hand sanitizer, right? Shh, shh, shh. Hand sanitizer. And well, you, look at that. That's got a heavy content of alcohol. Is that, is that a sin? Is alcohol a sin? From a chemical perspective, actually, it's a really good chemical. It's used for many things. Why is it used? It's because without the chemical, without the ethanol, that's the main one that's been used, ethanol, your, your, your products will become hardened. And so the alcohol allows it to remain smooth. That's why it's in creams and stuff like that. And the ethanol, of course, it's, it's a germ killer, things like that. Uh, my car that I've got up on the Sunshine Coast, we use E10 fuel. It's like, 10, is it 10% ethanol? I don't know what it is. It's some percentage, basically, ethanol, some alcohol. Am, am I committing sin when I use that fuel? Okay. You say, well, is alcohol a sin? Well, it's not a sin because it's a chemical, and that chemical can be used for good. That chemical can be used for evil. Okay. It's no different to marijuana. Is marijuana a sin? Listen, marijuana is just a plant. You know, God created marijuana. You know, it comes out of the ground. Is, can a tree, can a plant be a sin? Can a chemical compound be a sin? Of course not, all right? But can marijuana be used for good? Hey, it's got some really good oils that apparently can cure a lot of things. Apparently it can be used for very good, but can it be used for evil? Can it be used to destroy your brain? You're smoking that stuff and, and, and dummy that, absolutely. And so answer number one, is alcohol a sin? Well, no, it's not because it's just a chemical, right? Now you can use it for sinful purposes, or you can use it for good purposes, you know? And so that's answer number, uh, number one. What about answer number two? Is alcohol a sin? And of course, this usually has to do with drunkenness. Drunkenness, okay? So is getting drunk a sin? Is getting drunk a sin? Yes. Okay? And in fact, I don't really know of any Christians, I don't know of any Christians that would truly say, well, I don't think even drunkenness is a sin. I think most Christians can read their Bibles very clearly and understand getting you know, drunk, throwing up, forgetting what you did the night before because you were so heavy on alcohol. That is definitely a sin. It hurts your body. And especially as believers, we have the Holy Ghost living in our bodies. Our bodies are to be holy, acceptable unto the Lord. And if we're just destroying our bodies, yes, with alcohol, but with any other kind of products that might hurt our bodies, we're committing sin. We're, we're, we're hurting our bodies and God would not be able to use us in our bodies if we're just there destroying our bodies, destroying our brains. Of course, alcohol, uh, drunkenness destroys, you know, your brain cells. You know, it has a, a terrible effect on you. And so, you know, the, the, the issue with, with alcohol, though, and, and drunkenness is this. The question then becomes, well, what is drunkenness? You know, and, and what, I, what, I, what I think about this is kind of like, you know, the Bible is very clear. You know, if you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it's very clear that men are to have short hair and women are to have long hair. Very clearly in the Bible. In fact, it says, doth nature itself not teach you? You can go into pretty much any nation in this world, even people that are not Christian, people that do not have the Bible, and guess what you'll find in, in nature? 
by men and women standards. That you know, men are to have short hair and women generally have long hair. That's just a normal aspect of, of that, right? But here's the thing, what happens is people say, well, how short is short? How long is long? How drunk is drunk? And now you start to understand, well, hold on, why don't you just cut your hair short enough that it's clearly short? Or ladies, why don't you leave your hair long enough so it's clearly long? Well, how drunk is drunk? Well, how about you don't even touch that stuff so you don't have any of the effects of the alcohol? When you start answering, asking those kind of specific questions, that's where you can start to stumble. That's where you can start to fall. And I want to share with you uh, my position on this and help you understand this. Please go to Leviticus chapter 10. Go to Leviticus chapter 10 and verse number 8. Why is drinking alcohol, drunkenness in that sense, why is that harmful for us? Leviticus chapter 10 verse 8. Leviticus chapter 10 and verse number 8. And we're going to a time when the Lord is setting up a priesthood in the, in, in the nation of Israel. In verse number 8, it says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, So Aaron, remember, he's going to be the high priest, and his sons are going to be the priests serving in the tabernacle, in the temple. Verse number 9, he says, Do not drink wine, nor string, strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. You know what God's saying? If you drink strong drink, if you go and drink alcohol while you come and serve me, I'm going to kill you. Lest ye die. That's what God is saying, right? Now look at this. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. So even those that follow after you, all your children, children, children that become priests in the tabernacle, they're going to keep the same thing. Why is this important? Why? Verse number 10. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. That's why. Hey, I'm choosing you to be a priest because you've got to be able to differentiate between what is holy and what is unholy, what is clean and what is unclean. I need you to understand what is the difference between what is a sin and what is a righteous thing. So what is God saying? If you drink strong drink and alcohol, it's going to dull your senses. It's going to cloud your judgment. You're not going to be able to pass correct judgment because you've allowed the alcohol to have an effect on your brain. That's what he's teaching. Look at verse number 11. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So the priests were commanded, you've got to teach the whole Bible to your people. You've got to teach the Bible. Do you think a pastor should be under the influence of alcohol? The pastor has the same responsibility to teach the Word of God, right? Just like the priest. And, and alcohol will have an effect on changing your, the judgment that you have in your mind. Okay? You, you're under the influence of alcohol, you're going to start teaching incorrect things. You're not going to be able to tell the difference between holy and unholy. We say, well, that's the Old Testament priesthood. You know, we, we're not part of the Old Testament priesthood, surely. Yes, you're right. We're not part of the Old Testament priesthood. Please go to Proverbs 31 now. Go to Proverbs 31 and verse number 4. Proverbs 31, verse number 4. But I want you to understand, why was God so angry about it? Why, why did he prevent them? He says, look, if, if you drink it, I'm going to kill you. Okay, God is serious about how he wants the word of God to be preached. He wants the word of God to be preached by someone that has no, no, has no, is not under the influence of any alcohol. But look at Proverbs chapter 31 and verse number 4. And uh, it says here, these are the words of a mother to a king. And of course, this is uh, referring to King Solomon, but a, a name that his mother gave him here in verse number four. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. So this is a mother's advice, which was so good that God says, I want that in the Bible. That is canon. I'm going to write. Well, that's going to get written down for all generations. This is good advice. This is good sound advice. Okay, so no drink, no strong drink for kings. Just like pre uh, priests. Why? Why? Look at verse number five. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgments of any of the afflicted. Why were kings instructed not to drink alcohol, not to drink strong drink or wine? Because again, it perverts their judgment. Okay? The kings in these days had situations come before them. They had to pass a law. They had to make a decision. And the important thing was that they, their judgment was not clouded. Right? That they would not pervert. They would not forget the law of God. And let me tell you now, if you drink alcohol, you start taking this stuff, you're going to start forgetting the law of God. It's going to start perverting your, perverting your judgment when you read the word of God. Okay? Say, so, well, that's a king of the Old Testament. That's the priest of the Old Testament. That's not us. But here's the thing. You don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 says, And have made us, God has made us kings and priests. 
God has made, I'll read it again, and have made us, that's you, that's me, kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What are you in the New Testament? You're a king. You're a priest. Hey, what was the instruction for the priests not to drink alcohol, not to drink wine, not to drink, not to drink strong drink? Neither the kings. And listen, those guys were doing a very, uh, were ruling from a very carnal perspective, right? Uh, things to do with the tabernacle, things to do with a physical nation. Well, if that was right for them, how much more than us that make up a spiritual kingdom, that make up a spiritual nation, that are spiritually priests because we're in Jesus Christ? Listen, if that's good enough for the Old Testament kings and priests, shouldn't that be even better for us in now in the New Testament? Isn't that something that should be very clearly followed for us because we're kings and priests, we're commanded to pass judgment, we're commanded to understand the law of God, we're commanded to teach people, our children, our churches, what the Word of God says? Should we be under the effects of alcohol then? Should we be drinking wine and strong drink? No. The Bible's very clear. God says it's going to impair your judgments. You're going to forget my laws. Okay? Now... Let me show you my personal experience with drinking alcohol, okay? Now, I don't say this with any pride or, you know, I, I wish I never touched the stuff, to be honest with you, okay? But, you know, I, I remember uh, the first few times I drank alcohol, I just have a one beer, you know, what is it, 5% alcohol, let's say. One beer has 5%, or well, one, you know, wine has about 12 to 15%, just depends on the wine, right? So wine itself has like three times the alcohol content than just uh, one beer, okay? Now, I remember going out with my mates and we'd have a beer, I'd have a beer. Now, listen, nothing would change on the outside. Nothing would, my, my speech would not be slurred. My reactions would not be slower. I was pretty, no one, no, one could, no one could tell any different from the outside that I had one beer. Okay, and that's the Aussie way, just one beer, what's a big deal, right? I mean, I, no one can tell on the outside. But I'll tell you something, I could tell on the inside. I could tell I'm not 100% sober. I, the way I could tell was walking, when I would walk, my steps were just not sound. I was walking, it's not like I was like, you know, going from left to right and throwing up. I could just tell by taking certain steps that it was not as solid, it was not as grounded as I normally would be if I didn't drink that one beer. So I could already tell, and I already, I already thought, wow, the effects of just one beer with 5% alcohol, well, what about that wine that has like 13, 14, 15%, some, some have 18%, you know, alcohol in them. And I could, I could tell the effects that it had, had on me. Well, you know what would... What would and I'd share this with my friends. I'd say, well, this is why. This is why one beer is having an effect on you. Even though they could tell no difference on me. They said, because you need to build up a resistance. I'd say, well, how do you build up a resistance? You've got to keep drinking. <laughs> you know, you've got to get to a point where, you know, one beer has no effect. And maybe, maybe two or three beers, five beers won't have an effect on you. So what? Are you saying that I just got to keep getting, uh, lose my sobriety just so I can build up a resistance, so I can drink more alcohol, so I can, what, what in the world? Isn't that the opposite of what we're trying to achieve, to be sober-minded? And listen, I just noticed that, just myself, just, just one, I know, other times I would have another beer, I'd notice the same thing over and over again, it would have an effect on my steps. Now listen, we, we live in an ungodly world, right? We live in a wicked world, wouldn't you say that? I mean, just the fact that there was probably 250 abortions today in the, in the nation of Australia, I bet you didn't even hear that on the news today. You know, you've, but look, we live in a wicked world, okay? We live in a wicked world. But you know what? Even in this wicked world, this wicked world is still warning people not to drink alcohol. Okay, especially when you drive. And I got this information, I will, I'll, I'll share with you later where I got this information from, but this has to do with drinking and driving. And I want to share with you what, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I want to share with you what this, this is a government website, what it says, if you have seven beers, let's say, let's say you have seven drinks, what kind of effect it has on you when you drive. Number one, it says here, substantial impairment in vehicle control, loss of auditory information processing, so you can't hear as well, major loss of balance, vomiting may occur. That's with seven. All right, what about, oh, okay, seven, I won't have seven, I'll have six. All right, with six, it says, clear deter, de, uh, deterioration of reaction time, reduced ability to maintain lane position, reduced ability to break appropriately, slurred speech. I'd say, well, maybe five, maybe, uh, well, actually, no, I've got this wrong. Maybe four. Maybe four beers, right? I'll just have four, and then I can drive perfectly fine. It says, reduced ability to concentrate, short-term memory loss, lack of speed control, impaired perception, and self-control. 
Well, so maybe, okay, let's just, just free. I'll have free before I drive. Reduced coordination, reduced ability to track moving objects. Imagine that, you're driving. It reduces your ability to track moving objects. Isn't that what you do while you're driving the whole time? Difficulty steering, slower response to emergency driving situations. So, well, maybe just two beers. Well, two beers says decline in visual functions, inability to perform two tasks at the same time, loss of judgment, altered mood. Now, this information doesn't have what one beer does to you, but I know what one beer did to me. And the fact that he already had an effect on my step. Look, if two beers has an effect like this, you can't tell me that one beer is not going to have an effect. That's 5% alcohol. Okay? And I got this information from the centers, centers of Disease Control and Prevention. You know what it's saying? It's saying here that alcohol is a disease. That's where it's from. The, the Center of Disease Control. Now look, we're trying to protect ourselves well, I don't know, maybe, not, maybe not all of you are, but you know, from this COVID-19 disease, right? Look at all, look how much is, is happening in this world to prevent an outbreak of this disease. And yet they have no problem with making, you know, allowing people to go to the pub and drink alcohol. And, the, you know, they're saying, look, it's a disease. It has an effect on you. In fact, I guarantee you more people have died from alcohol than COVID-19, from drunkenness, okay? From impairment of judgment. And so is alcohol a sin in the sense that it causes you to be drunk? Well, absolutely it's a sin. Well, that's, that's definite. Sure. Even our world, our ungodly, wicked world that has no problem aborting babies says, hey, you need to stop doing that. In fact, if you try to get your L's, how many beers are you allowed to have if you try to get your learner's license at 16? Zero, zero. If they catch you drinking alcohol or under the effects, you've lost your license, okay? So even in this wicked world, they realize we better tell people to stop drinking because alcohol has an effect on your mind. It has an effect on your ability to function. And so, yes, it is, it is a sin. And so the next thing is, like I said, well, how much, what is drunkenness? How far does it go? Well, listen, if one beer already has an effect, you got to start thinking about that. Is that be worth it? Is that, is, will the Lord be pleased? Am I going to be able to open up the Word of God and teach my family the Word of God after I've had a beer or whatever it is that people drink? Right? It starts to have an effect on you. What is it? You know, can we drink in moderation? You know, can I have, well, you know, half a glass of wine with my, with my meal? You know, just, just one here, one there. You know, what effects that that has for me? Well, the Bible's already very clear that, uh, you know, uh, it, it has an a, effect on your judgment. And so the thought is, well, you know, as long as you don't get drunk, as long as you don't have drunk, you know, if, if you get tipsy, all right, but you don't get drunk, that's okay. You get tipsy, you get a buzz, you get a bit of a high, you know, it helps you relax a little bit, you get tipsy. Well, you know what? I looked up what tipsy means in the dictionary. Okay, you know what it means, tipsy? I wouldn't have given it this definition, but the dictionary gives it this definition. By definition, tipsy means slightly drunk. Does God want us to get drunk? No. Do you think he wants us to get slightly drunk? No. So let's give it a nice name, tipsy. Okay, maybe God is happy for us to be tipsy. No, he doesn't want us to be drunk at all. Now, one of the reasons I didn't care much for this doctrine, number one, because I didn't really, I never drank alcohol. You know, things that you're interested in, you're going to study more. And so I was never really interested in alcohol, so I never really studied it out. But one thing that was very clear to me as someone that read the Bible is how many times God says that being sober, like he wants us to be sober, sober-minded, so many times to be sober. And listen, when it comes to sobriety, we're talking about someone that is not under the influence of alcohol. Okay? But what does that mean exactly? Being sober. Okay? Well, if you can please turn to Titus chapter 2. Let's have a look at this. Titus chapter 2. Why am I turning to Titus? Because Titus was a pastor. Okay, Titus was a pastor. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus to help him to uh, lead his church, to teach his church. And listen, I'm basically a Titus, right? And I need instruction. I need to learn how to grow as a pastor. I need to know what it is that I need to preach. And in Titus chapter 2, verse number 1, Paul says to Titus, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Hey, this topic of drunkenness is a topic that is, required, that is called sound doctrine. Okay, this is well-grounded. This is not something of a matter of opinions. It's a well-grounded, sound doctrine. What is it? Number, verse number 2. That the aged men be sober. Hey, the elderly, the older people in your church, teach them to be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, 
in patience. Look at verse number three. The aged women likewise. What does likewise mean? In the same way, the same manner, right? So you just, you just teach the aged men to be sober. What do you teach the, the uh, aged women? Likewise, teach them to be sober as well, right? That they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Look at this. That they may teach the young women to be sober. So not just the elderly, not just the old man and the old woman, but the old women should teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Look at verse number six. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. How many times was Titus instructed to teach his church, to teach them to be sober? Hey, you're old, you're an old man, be sober. You're an older lady, be sober. You're a younger lady, be sober. You're a young man, be sober. And look, I know that is not just about alcohol. I know that sobriety also, you know, you can throw in uh, the teachings of, obviously, drugs. You know, things that will get you off your face like marijuana, you know, uh, cocaine. You know, all these hard drugs that, that cause you to lose sobriety. You know, God's command is for you to be sober. And listen, if you've got some of these things in your life, I'm telling you, it's going to destroy your mind. It's going to destroy your your understanding of the Word of God. It's not going to make God happy. He might even kill you early, just like He promised the priest that He'll do. Okay? And it's time to get rid of these substances that destroy your brain. You know, God wants us to be sober. That means that we are sound. We have a strong mind. We can pass judgment correctly. We're not being affected by some other products, whether that's alcohol or some other, you know, uh, pr- you know, products like hard drugs and things like that. So you can see, you know, I could just see how often God would speak about being sober. Why would I want my mind to be affected? Now, let me tell you something. Sober means that you're sound. You know, you can you have full judgment. You have full control. So if I've had that one beer, now I didn't go in and do some wickedness. I didn't go and commit some grave sin and, and destroy my testimony and my life over one drink. But I could tell, like I said, that one step that I took was just not quite right. Was just not, I don't know, maybe it's 99.9% sound, but there's 0.1% there that I realized there's something off. Was I being sober at that point? Was I striving to be sober? No, I had lost. Even if it's just a small, minute amount, I had lost a level of sobriety. And God's commandment for me is to be sober. God's commandment for you is to be sober. Okay? Please go to Proverbs 23, where uh, Brother uh, Matthew read for us, please. Proverbs chapter 23. I better hurry up. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 29. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 29. The Bible reads, Who have woe? Now, woe is like misery. Who's got misery? Okay. Who have sorrow? That's like depression. All right. Who have contentions? That's people that are in strife and struggling, right? Who have babbling? That's like foolish talking. Who have wounds without cause? You get hurt for no reason. Who have redness of eyes? It's like inflammation of the eyes. Who are these people that, are, that make up this description? Who are they? Verse number 30. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. But I was saying, look, the drunkards. These are the people that have these problems, these woes, these miseries, these contentions, these babblings, these wounds without cause, this redness of eyes. It comes to drunkards. Look at verse number 31. Now, I want us to really focus on this verse. Pay attention to it. It says, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Okay, so let's understand what is this talking about. So it says, look not upon the wine when it is red. Why is it referring to redness there? Well, when it comes to uh, a grape, I don't know if you've ever, uh, as a child, I don't, know if, I don't know if you guys do this, but I used to peel my grapes. I used to peel off the, the skin, because you know the skin sometimes is kind of bitter. So you kind of just want the sweet juice so you peel off the the skin it's a bit frustrating but then you just eat it but then when you peel it off like the grape itself is kind of like a whitish color and if you were to squeeze it it's not red it's it's white right so what makes wine red you know what it is it's the seeds and it's the skin okay so by mixing the 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 juice with the skin and with the seeds it starts to give your wine the, the, the color red okay and what's that about well on the skin you may sometimes notice on your grapes there's like a bit of a, a white film sometimes on it well that's that's basically a, a, like a, a yeast okay natural based yeast and if that yeast gets into the sugar okay just like some type of bacteria it starts to eat it up and the produce will be 
fermentation. It'll cause some, some level of alcohol that, that ferments out of that. Okay? And so when people make wine, they use that natural yeast, but then the, the producers will also add further yeast to reach a certain standard or to make it more alcoholic, that kind of stuff, right? And so when it's talking about a wine when it is red, what it's referring to is the fact that it's been crushed with the skin and with the seeds and within that skin it's got the yeast which causes fermentation which causes it to become alcoholic but it's not just when it's red so you know if i went to eat, drink grape juice and the grape juice is red is, am i am i told not to drink that natural grape juice is that what it's referring to well, let's keep going it says when he giveth his color in the cup now this is so important in this verse okay it's not there for a reason because i've told you that alcohol is not a sin all right, so when I go and put some E10 fuel in my car, am I putting that in a cup so I can drink it? Is that what's going on? Or when I use some hand sanitizer, am I, am I going to put that in a cup and drink that straight? Is that what I'm aiming to do? Right? Or, or if I get some toothbrush, toothpaste to brush my teeth, am I putting toothpaste in a cup to drink that toothpaste? No, of course. Referring to the cup here is the fact that someone's going to participate of a strong drink, of a strong uh, you know, alcohol uh, uh, product and then it says here when it moveth itself aright so this drink moves what is that referring to well if you understand the fermentation process when the sugar's been break broken down to alcohol it starts to become fizzy it starts to bubble up right it becomes fizzy and that's that's basically within your cup it's moving because it's got that fermentation that's happened so it's gone red and it's moving and God is saying look Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when he giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. You know what God is saying? If someone comes and puts a cup of alcohol there on the table and says, drink up, he says, don't even look at it. Because if you look at it, you're going to be tempted to drink it. Okay? That's what you're not meant to look at. You're not meant to look at the cup that you're going to partake of, the drink that can cause you to lose sobriety. Okay? That's the sin. Okay? How, well, how much of that cup? Don't even look at it, the Bible says. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, listen, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a preacher of God's word. I'm meant to preach his word clearly. Okay? And drinking alcohol is clearly a sin. God says don't do it. Look at verse number 32. At the last, it biteth like a serpent. It stingeth like an adder. Listen, if you get bitten by a snake, you've got snakes, brother, but they don't bite, right? They, well, they don't have venom, right? But if they did, what would you do? You could lose your life, right? There's venom. You know what, what God is saying? In that alcohol, that is toxic. It's venom. It can kill you, okay? It's comparing it to the venom of a snake, right? It's toxic. It can destroy your body. It attacks your liver. A lot of people have liver damage, you know, that reduces their quality of life because they were drunkards. They would drink alcohol. Look at verse number 34. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth in the midst of the sea, and as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. So it says, look, if you drink out, you're going to be like someone on a sea. So the winds are bringing you, you know, you've seen drunken people, I'm sure. They can't, they can't stand up. They fall over. It's like they're being tossed by the sea, right? That's what God is saying. They're going to fall down. They're staggering. Look at verse number 35. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You know what it's saying there? He says, look, I've been beaten. I was under the influence of alcohol. I was beaten. I was hurt, and I don't even remember it. I didn't even feel it. How many times do you hear about people that got into stupid things, you know, uh, destroyed, you know, uh, committed some kind of crime, and they're like, yeah, but I was under the influence of alcohol. I don't even remember it. I don't even, they, they wake up with sores and pain. They got into some type of fight in the pub, and they don't even remember because they've been under the influence of alcohol. And then it says there at the end of verse number 35, I will, and, sorry, when shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. It says, listen, I, I had a terrible time with that alcohol, but when I wake up, the first thing I'm going to be thinking about is where's that alcohol? Where's that beer? Why? Because it's addictive. It's an addictive substance. Okay, so you start drinking that stuff, you're, you're going to find it hard to give up. Okay? There are many things in life that are addictive. Once they become addicted to you, it's very hard, very sinful thing, uh, a very difficult thing to give up. That's why when it's in the cup there, God says, don't even look at it. You know, don't, don't even touch it. Don't even look at it. Don't go near there. And listen, if you've been someone that's been affected by alcohol, you've been a drunken in the past, you've, really, you know, you've had difficulty in this area, I would recommend just always stay away from the possibility. You know, if, if somebody invites you into a pub just to like a bistro, just for a meal, if I had a problem with alcohol, I, just, I wouldn't go into a pub. I wouldn't want to go into a place where uh, I, I could be tempted to look at that and desire to drink it. 
You know, so this is a sin that the Bible is very clear. Like, sorry, if you go to, go to Proverbs chapter 20, go to Proverbs chapter 20 now. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 1. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You know what I want from you, brethren? I want you to be wise. You know, I preach the word of God because I want you to have knowledge. I want you to grow in wisdom. I want you to be more like Jesus Christ. And the Bible says here, look, you can be wise or you can be mocked or you can be uh, 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 raged. Okay, you know what's going to cause you to be mocked and get you into a rage? Wine, the strong drink. I mean, listen, I don't like being mocked. I don't know about you. We've all got feelings. I don't want to be mocked by a drink. <laughs> out of all things but that's what wine does it will laugh at you it mocks you okay it's it's addictive it gets a hold of you it's got control of you you may think you have control over that alcohol no the alcohol has control of you the alcohol mocks you will make fun of you and so brethren can i drink you know just just a modest amount listen if it's in a cup if it's purpose consuming it directly into your mouth i think the bible is very clear don't even look at it. Don't even go there. Okay? But is alcohol a sin as a chemical compound? Of course not. Okay? So we have to uh, be intelligent with how we apply this. And I think it's wise, especially for our children, to learn this. Because, you know, uh, within some churches, you, you, may, you, know, you may hear the teaching, stay away from alcohol. Alcohol is a sin. But then when the kids grow up, they start looking around the house and go, hold on. Wait, look at that vanilla extract there. Didn't mom just make you know, vanilla cake the other day, it's got 35% alcohol. If the kid drank that, wouldn't not he get drunk? Absolutely. But is it for the purpose of drinking in a cup though? No. And this is where, you know, people start asking me questions like this. Well, should I have this product in the house? Should I have that product in the house? And this is where, when it, you know, it's not for me to come into your house and tell you what to have in your house. I personally, I don't know if my wife has vanilla extract in her house. If she does, I have no problem with that. Obviously, we're gonna keep that away from the children. I don't think the children would even desire to open that and drink it anyway. I don't think they even know what that is, right? But this is a matter of conscience, all right? If there are products in your house that contain alcohol and in your conscience it bothers you, then just get rid of it, okay? But if your conscience says, well, no, you know, this isn't uh, an issue for us, you know, we'll keep it. But here's the thing. Obviously, we're not talking about the strong drink. We're not talking about the drink that you put into a cup and consume orally, okay? Let me just give you another thought here. You know, I, I, I hate alcohol, but I love spaghetti. Sometimes I'd go to an uh, Italian restaurant and I'll just get my spaghetti bolognese, right? And there's, I'm, I'm eating that spaghetti bolognese and I'm telling Christina, right, we're on a date or something. I say, man, this is like the best spaghetti I've ever eaten. And she goes, she tries it and she goes, oh, because it's got wine. It's got red wine in, in the sauce, right? And I'm like, oh, man. But obviously it's been cooked. Obviously the alcohol there is not going to get anyone drunk. So as, in, in my conscience, though, I wasn't really bothered by that. But now that I'm a pastor, all right, now that I'm a pastor and I've obviously got to set an example, if I ever went out to an Italian restaurant with you, you know what I'm not going to order? Spaghetti bolognese. Even, even though I want to eat it, why? Why would you not do it? Because if I did it and it had some red wine in there, it could cause my brothers to stumble. You know, someone might say, well, hold on. Why doesn't Pastor Kevin have a you know, problem with this meal? Hey, it's got wine in it. Is it okay for me now to go out and drink some wine and drink some alcohol? So obviously as a pastor who's got to set a better example, you know, I would withhold from doing that to not allow my brothers to stumble. Okay? But you know, in, in my conscience, I would not have a problem with that meal because I know that would not get me drunk. It's not like I'm drinking it from a cup and, and consuming it, you know, something like that. So obviously, I don't want to tell you how to control your house, but if you do think there's a product in your house that if it falls in the hands of your children or even yourself, you know, an addiction that you may have, you know, I would say you want to get rid of that. You want to get rid of that, okay? So obviously this is a sin that will get you kicked out of church. Now you might, someone might come up to me and say, well, I saw brother so-and-so have a beer the other day. Would you kick them out? You know, at the end of the day, you know, these are not easy decisions to make. You know, if someone drinks one beer, I'm probably not going to kick him out of the church. In fact, if, someone, if I find out someone does, I'll probably talk to him and say, look, be careful what you're doing, like set a good example, especially if you're a parent or something like that, right? Um, and here's the other thing though, you know, when it comes to accusations, the Bible's very clear that you need two or three witnesses. You know, so I'm not going to go off someone's one word. Obviously, we need multiple witnesses for that. I mean, that should be the legal system anyway in, in things. So you want people to, to be a witness of that. But, you know, obviously, if someone in this church, if we find out, you know, is just 
just a full-on drunk, right? He, you know, he's found on the side of the road and, and this becomes news in our church. I'm going to have to tell that person, you've got to leave the church. You're not allowed here until you repent of that, until you apologize of that and you can be part of the church. Say, why? Because alcohol appeals to the flesh. It's addictive. It's an addictive substance. If we allow someone in our church to be a drunkard, to be openly drinking alcohol, it's going to cause others to be like, well, why not me? And then they're going to fall. You may not even have that much of a problem, but you may have uh, the effect of causing somebody else to get into that drink, to get into alcohol, to get drunk. So obviously, for me, this would be a case-by-case scenario where you're clearly drunk and your reputation has been hurt, has hurt the church or, or whatever, okay? The other one, and if you can turn to, uh, I'll just, actually, I'll just read it to you. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15 says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look upon their nakedness. So it said there, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. So here's another reason why I might kick you out of church about this topic of alcohol. If you go to someone in this church, and say, hey, come and have a drink with me. Hey, come to the pub with me. Hey, come to the club with me. Let's go have a drink together. Well, in that case, I would kick you out as well. Because the was very clear. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor to drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also. You know what that's saying? If you go and invite your mate out for a drink, he says, you're a drunkard. And you're causing him to be a drunken also. And so the commandment is very clear. Drunkards are to be kicked out of the church. Now, if you say to me, Pastor Kevin, I had no idea the Bible said that you know, and uh, I drink alcohol today, and, you know, I don't want to be kicked out of the church. Well, you know, first of all, go to the Lord and ask Him for His help. I mean, the Lord has saved your soul. He can help you from that addiction, if that's a problem that you have. Number two, if you, if it does bother your conscience, come and talk to me. Like, I'd rather you come and talk to me, and I understand you have a problem with this, so I can be praying for you, so I can try to help you, so that way you're not embarrassed if you do struggle with that sin. At least you have someone else that you can talk to, right? And, and so I'm willing to, to help people. You know, I don't expect someone to come into the church and be like this perfect Christian from day number one. Obviously, people come into the church and they've got all kinds of sins, all kinds, of, you know, especially if they've not been in church or they've not been saved for a long time. You know, just because someone just gets newly saved, they come to church and we find out he drinks alcohol, I'm not going to kick him out of the church necessarily, right? Obviously, the Bible is very clear that the person that we kick out of the church is a brother. Someone that's been saved for a long time, someone that's been in church for a long time, someone that we, we, we know that is a faithful member of his church and they've destroyed the testimony, that's the person that will need to be kicked out, not obviously the brand new Christian that struggles in this area. So brethren, you know, if this is a topic you struggle with, please number one, go to Christ, go to God, go sort it out. And I understand there might be even people in this church right now that struggle with that because we live in Australia. You know, it's all right, mate. You know, let's go to the pub and have a, have a beer. I understand there's that culture here. But you know what? The Bible is not consistent with our nation's culture. You know, we don't belong to this nation, actually. The Bible is very clear. We belong to a spiritual nation. God has made us priests and kings. And listen, I don't want God to kill me. One of the qualifications of being a pastor is not given to wine. Why? Because you've got to pass judgment, because you've got to teach the law of God. But hey, we are all kings and priests. And so, you know, I pray that if this is something that you struggle with, that you do get it right with the Lord. Let's pray.